Welcome to Geared for Growth. I'm your host, Mike Mortlock from MCG Quantity Surveyors. Today we're talking all about the legal side of property transactions and I'm joined with Melissa Barlas, who is the founder of Conveyed, an Australian Law Awards winner as well as a sole practitioner of the year for 2023, but she is growing her business and her team and her jurisdictions around the country and we have some excellent questions for her and she shares a lot of knowledge in and around what buyers need to know if they're transacting in different states, what happens in contract reviews and what information people will put in there or solicitors or conveyances will put in there to try and advocate for their side and she gives some great tips around the timing of engaging the experts and the sort of experts that you need to make sure you have a safe and quality transaction on a proper that is going to stand the test of time. It's an awesome interview with Melissa and I'm sure you'll get something out of it. Here she is. Melissa Barlas, thanks for joining me on Geared for Growth. Thank you for having me. I think uh, I've been excited about this one because we haven't really done a big deep dive into your area of expertise, which essentially is property transactions or conveyancing as people might come to know it. But Perhaps people in your industry might actually be disappointed by it being known as conveyancing because there are conveyances and then there are also solicitors and they both sort of work in this space. And I think the average punter knows that well, you'll pay a premium for a solicitor over a conveyancer. But, you know, in this kind of world where it's like, all right, well, the cheapest option is what I'm going to go for. Where, where, what are some of the pitfalls in those decisions? I would start off by saying, because there's a couple of really interesting things that you raised there. One is about, you know, conveyancer versus solicitor. How does that that all work? Yeah. But also about the price aspect of things as well and people making decisions on price. And my theory mm. for that is with conveyancing, I would I would argue that conveyancing is probably the most under-celebrated an undervalued property professional in the grand scheme of things when you buy or you sell a property. So, for example, your real estate agent gives you instant gratification when you buy something yeah. because you've bought something. It's a big deal. You've made a really good financial, you've made a, hopefully a good one, um, a financial <laughs> um, decision to, to help create wealth or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but you also get instant gratification from your mortgage broker because they're the ones that secure your finance. When that happens, happy days, you know you can move ahead. But then you've got the yes. conveyancer in the middle who does the legal legwork in order to get you to become the owner. So that's what they do in a nutshell. But there's no instant gratification in that process. So as a result, we become naturally an undervalued resource in the eyes of the consumer and an un un uncelebrated resource. And I think that's really something that um, is important to, to understand. And so as a result of that, people are making decisions based on price or, or whatnot because they don't have that same level of appreciation for that professional versus an agent or a mortgage broker, for example. So that's something that I just wanted to make a point of. But it's also just as important to educate people about price because you know it's it's kind of like with a lot of other things and, and, and industries you kind of get what you pay for when you're engaging a, um, a professional um, and if you provide if I provide like a case um, you know, a case example of it mm. let's say you've engaged a professional that charges a super cheap price point which is great you know big tick, yay, I'm saving a buck. But that professional may be attracting a very high volume of clients. So if you've got someone attracting a high volume of clients, where does your matter sit in the pile? Maybe in the middle, maybe on the bottom. So if you're needing to contact that person on short notice or in a, an emergency situation, you need to ask yourself, are they going to pick up the phone? So that's something that um, is a point that I wanted to make to, to educate. Um, mm. So you do have to kind of look into it a little bit more deeply and not just make decisions on price, but make decisions on, you know, based on the other person, 
on the other side of the phone? Are they um, a solicitor? Are they a licensed conveyancer that you're speaking to? Are they experienced? Do they come across as an expert? Do they know what they're talking about? You know, um, and it, it can be easy enough to, uh, to, to gauge that when you're speaking to someone. So it's very important when you're making the biggest financial decision of your life that you're engaging experts on your side to help manage your risk and manage that process properly and smoothly all the way through to settlement. Um, I think you raised a good point, But on that point, question, right? oh, absolutely. Sorry, let me finish. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was just going was just to say gonna that, add... that you, you don't often get, um, you know, the conveyancer of the year award. Like we're used to real estate agents and buyer's agents congratulating themselves on how good they are, but you don't often hear about like, oh, well, this person is actually the best conveyancer in Australia right now. <laughs> yeah, you don't. No, you don't. Um, uh, and there are a dime a dozen. So it's, uh, it's, it's not something that you, you, you see a lot of. Uh, we're fortunate, obviously, we've um, come out on, in 2023 as the Australian Law Award winners, which we're very um, proud of. Um, but going you to go. your point, hey, I just said wonderful. There you go. Yes. You are, there is an award. Um, there is an award answer. that exists. <laughs> exactly. And you won it. Well done. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're proud of that. But um, I was just going to add in answer to your question about the difference between a conveyancer and a solicitor, because a lot of people mm. have that preconception that they do the same thing, exactly the same thing. So to an extent they do in the sense that they're both trained to um, prepare for a settlement to do the conveyancing work. That doesn't change. But if you needed legal advice, you may actually find that you get a better scope um, of service from a solicitor because they're actually trained, qualified and insured to um, to give you legal advice and to represent you if something curly comes out of a situation. Um, for example, if you're needing to be advised on your rights if you, you can't proceed with the transaction anymore or if um, the other party breaches the contract in any way, um, a responsible a responsible conveyancer will refer you on to a solicitor to give you that advice. Um, but that's just the, the, the two differences. It's really the scope of service that you get um, and the level of training that you get from a solicitor um, versus a, a, a licensed conveyancer. Do you think part of the problem and why people in your industry aren't as celebrators as perhaps they ought to be is that it's kind of like a dark art. It's like, okay, well, we're transferring. Okay, so we need money from the bank and for some reason there's a very expensive stamp they need to use because stamp duty doesn't sort of, you know, any stamp I've ever bought, you know, is probably five or six bucks. Um, but, you know, we're paying tens of thousands of dollars for stamp duty. So it's got to go to the place where they do the stamps and then it's legally yours. And the knowledge for people is probably not much more sophisticated than that. Certainly my knowledge is not much more sophisticated than that. Um, so what, what, what do you think you would like to communicate to people to say, well, there's actually a little bit more to it than that? Because I assume there is. There is, definitely. Um, I guess... Uh... Yeah, and every and every transaction is unique. You have to remember you might have you might be someone listening that has bought property before or sold property before and sort of has a a conceptual understanding of the process involved in um you know preparing for a settlement. Um but you can't say universally that that, that the two times you've done it before, it's going to be exactly the same as the third time. Every transaction is unique and they all come with their different complexities um, and people need to to understand that, you know, not one transit, transaction fits all. Yeah. So give us some case studies if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, that's a terrible way to put it. Would you mind providing some examples where a conveyancer would really reach their limit and they would need a solicitor. I'm assuming that it's not something that happens all the time, but it, but regular enough that, that you would see instances where, look, something has happened, they've breached the contract or something has been discovered where it really shifts from conveyancer to solicitor. Yeah, um, I can come up with probably a, a few little examples. For example, um, I'd actually had this recently. Um, one sister helped another sister buy a property. The sister that helped the other one 
put money towards the deposit, but the property wasn't put in her name. But they treat the property as though they both own it, even though technically one owns it. So the other mm. sister is now saying, I'd like to actually be able to claim some sort of um, claim some sort of entitlement um, to um, proceeds if the property was ever sold. You know, um, how can I, how can I, how can I um, achieve that for myself? That is outside of the scope of a conveyancer. Mm. That mm. is solicitor territory because you need to get very carefully considered advice on the sorts of options you have available in that situation, um, whether that's by way of a binding financial agreement or a loan agreement, um, you know, et cetera. Um, so that's one example. Another example can be that you've, you've um, settled on a property but you've discovered that there has been a major building defect um, that wasn't disclosed at the beginning by the vendor. And so you're now wanting advice on what can I do about that? What is my legal position? That's, again, something that a solicitor can deal with. Um, even situations, especially um, I find um, when people buy off the plan, and for those that don't know what off the plan is, it's when a property isn't titled but at the time that you buy the property. Um, so think about the new developments in the outskirts of your um, city. Um, but if you're buying an off the plan, there's lots of risk that comes with that that can require legal advice. For example, um, changes to the plan. Uh, plan of subdivision, for example, if mm. there's material changes and you need represent representation to deal with that, a solicitor could come into it. Um, mm. uh, so there's lots of lots of very unique examples where you may find it handy to have engaged a solicitor, a conveyancing solicitor from the outset just to make sure you've got, I guess, um, the expertise on hand from the beginning just mm. in case something early happens. And what's the difference between, let's say, a price point for a traditional conveyancing company to a solicitor-based um, conveyancing company? And what are the the different levels of experience? Or what what do what do you have to be? What do you have to have studied to be a solicitor versus a conveyancer? Yeah. So the price points, if we if we're using the example of a standard transaction, um, fairly vanilla. Um, yep. The price points shouldn't vary too too much at all. I find with conveyancing overall, the price points can vary from say seven seventy to about two grand, depending on what your situation is, depending on what you're yep. needing done. Um, so that's where I find, but so both solicitors and licensed conveyances should be falling within that round. And I'm speaking for the Victorian jurisdiction specifically. Yep. Um, uh, but that's just an example of price point. Um, in terms of study and um, between the two, um, you know, conveyances will, will go through a licensed conveyance course. That might be a six to 12 month um, course for them to be able to do just specifically, you know, preparing for settlement type work. Conveyance, yep. uh, sorry, solicitors would go through about four years of full time. Um, um yeah study to be qualified as a solicitor and then following that you'd have an extra year to a year and a half of um practical legal training um and, and some work experience before you become a fully fledged solicitor mm. that's a big difference from an educational yeah. point of view but you're saying yeah. that there is actually a bit of crossover you could potentially find a conveyancer that's that's more expensive than a solicitor by, by the sounds of it uh, you can, but you, again, if you are comparing um, and, and shopping and looking around, you should always base your decision off how experienced is the other person over the phone and how comfortable yep. do I feel um, with them uh, because that is the person that's going to be my right hand, um, my sidekick the whole way um, mm. to to protect me all the way through to the end. So you have to yeah. really make an informed decision. And I think it's about balance. You want to try and find someone that's got the best balance between price and quality. If you go with that approach, um, then you may find the right person for you. Excellent. Yeah, and I guess you've got to have someone that you feel comfortable asking questions or not feeling like you're asking stupid questions and, and also feeling like if you pick up the phone, they're going to answer. 
as well, yes. right? Because urgent things do pop up. Can you give us an example of, of, of situations that you've seen where it's like, well, actually, this requires immediate action? The Give for Growth Property Investing Podcast is presented by our business, MCG Quantity Surveyors. If you're an investor or a property professional looking to get the best tax depreciation deductions for yourself or your clients, please get in touch with us at mcgqs.com.au. It's our mission to help as many property investors as we can to maximize their claims and maximize their property education as well. Very classic example, you've got an auction on a Saturday, you've just discovered the property on a Friday morning and you're needing an urgent <laughs> review of that contract before the auction on Saturday. Um, that's a, a very, very common um, scenario and that is a perfect example of where you need someone that's quite responsive um, to you. Um, mm. So if you're picking up the phone and calling a, a, a conveyancer for the first time, you want to make sure that the call gets answered because that's going to give you a good indication of, you know, how quickly does this firm respond to my needs. Um, mm. With us, we generally turn around contract reviews within a 48-hour window on average. That's not even based on a unique situation um, and we do yep. it sooner in emergency situations. So um, responsiveness is a, is a big deal and that's probably the best example of that. Let's, let's talk about these contract reviews. So at the end of the day, you are buying a house or a unit, but in, in many respects you're buying the contract because that can come with all sorts of clauses or conditions. What are some of the key things that you see as a variation to a standard in a, in a contract? Uh, I see a lot of things. It's, a, it's a, like an endless <laughs> stream. Um, uh, I find the two key areas that um, that I see variations for are uh, sometimes I see scenarios where vendors are limiting the purchaser's rights against the vendor in the event that the vendor breaches the contract somehow and at the same time expanding the vendor's rights in the event that the purchaser breaches the contract. So it creates that uneven level playing field. So I see that a lot um, in uh, contracts of sale. Um, and, and I see that commonly, whether it's a titled property or an untitled property. Um, with, uh, say, something like an off the plan, I see some instances where developers don't put defect liability clauses for the purchaser to have some sort of contractual recourse against them um, in the event that um, they don't build the property uh, um, or they build the property with defects in it, which is yep. fairly common. Um, yeah. So we see that a lot and and um, and advise clients a lot on that. Um, what else? We see... Uh, uh, situations where um, vendors try to make it easier on themselves to access a purchaser's deposit before settlement. Right, so there's yeah. certain legislative prerequisites that they, they need to comply with, particularly in the Victorian state, um, to be able to do that. Uh, and I see um, situations where they try to make that easier on themselves under the contract, even though they can't really circumvent legislation. So mm -hmm. they're just some some little examples. Typically, why would a solicitor or a conveyancer set up a contract of sale, you know, acting for the vendor with a bias towards the vendor? Is it often that they're hiding something or they're just wanting to advocate as best as they can? Because surely the other side's going to see it and go, well, that's not really the normal way we play the game. So, you know, is there a little bit of a kind of a fight between solicitors when they're, they're overly advocating for one side? say a fight, uh, but certainly someone with enough experience, <laughs> like me and my team, would very much pick up yeah. on something that looks very heavy-handed. Um, I call it a bastardised contract. That's how I, how right. I call it. But uh, uh, but you get uh, you get that from time to time. And I think the reason they do it is I think overall they're, they're trying to protect their client's interests um, as much as possible. But, but yeah. those sorts of conveyances need to be aware that if you start doing that, 
you start to fall within the unfair terms regime. So there's been a, a, a regime change from the beginning of this year about unfair terms and the consequences that vendor clients would bear, very significant ones, um, which is another story for another time, but very significant ones um, if you've got significantly unfair terms in the contract. So, yeah. you know, they're not, they're doing them and their client a disservice by doing that as opposed to creating a balanced contract. Yeah, I guess that makes sense, right? It's a consumer protection because you might have a very highly skilled solicitor against a rather junior conveyancer that might not necessarily pick this up or not understand the implications. And it's, I mean, in the eyes of, of, of the legislators, they want fairness, right? They don't want someone to be sort of fleeced or, you know, taken advantage of because of their choice of experts, which it's difficult for a lay person to, to make that decision on who is the right expert for them. And maybe they are just looking at, at price, right? So uh, is it your view that that's like a good thing? That's a protection for people? Uh, as, well, if I could just add, anything can be resolved by way of communication. If you can communicate mm. a, a, a solution to any scenario that arises before settlement, um, you know, things can get resolved. It's, it, that's all it comes down to. You can be as simple as picking up the phone and uh, with, with the other party. Um uh, but, yeah, my sentiments don't change. You know, if you've got a contract that is uh, uh, provides an unbalanced favouritism to uh, protecting the risks of the vendor, that puts both the vendor and the purchaser at risk. Mm, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> now, you mentioned a little key word uh, a few minutes ago, and that was jurisdiction. You were talking about Victorian jurisdiction and you know, that's one of, for me, the annoying things about transacting in property is that the states make their own decisions and they're not all on the same page. So there are some states where you need to have your insurance before you're exchanging because then you're liable. Uh, there are ones that have cooling off periods that are that are different, states that where it can be waived. You know, what, what are some of the key ones that you think people transacting around the country need to realise that it's actually variable states? state to state yes there's uh it, it is and uh if you can compare opposites buying a property in queensland the the risk allocation issues are so much different there versus states like new south wales in victoria and victoria um for example um if you uh buy in um, new south wales uh, you've got a five business day cooling off period in Victoria. It's a three business day cooling off period. Um, in Queensland, you don't have many disclosures about the property under the contract when you buy it. So your due diligence before you buy is so, so important um, because, you know, you're lucky if you get a title search attached to that contract. Whereas in Victoria and New South Wales, they have substantial disclosure requirements about the property uh, that need to be seen as attached to the to the contract, so um, it's it is uh, a very different and and it means that you're you know you should be engaging um, com a conveyancer that's well versed in a particular state. So if you're buying in mm -hmm. Queensland, um, you know you you may want to engage a firm that. Um, uh, specialises in Queensland conveyancing. For example, we do Victoria and Queensland and shortly um, a few other states as well, which is exciting. But mm. you want to um, be be engaged, engaging someone that's well-versed. You, you literally cannot engage someone in Queensland and expect that they'll know what, what to do in Victoria because it's so different. And, I was yeah, it leads me to a question that I had around national conveyancing businesses you don't really see seem to see you know national conveyancing businesses very very often is that just because of the complexity between state to state or are there other reasons why you don't see a lot of people saying look we can help you across the whole country 
Yeah, look, I think it's a combination of many conveyances sort of staying in their own lane and, and mm. there's a lot of small business conveyances around. There's there's That makes up the majority of the market, um, small businesses. So if they're well-versed in New South Wales conveyancing, you find in most cases they're not, they'll stick to that. And also it's exposure to risk. Um, if you're not experienced in doing conveyancing in a different state, you know, it, there is a massive exposure to risk. Um, your insurer may not cover you for that, especially if you're only a licensed conveyancer. And certainly if you're only a licensed conveyancer, not a solicitor, you're legally not allowed to practice in another state unless you actually become licensed in that particular state. So it is a regulatory nice. thing, um, but I think it's also um, experience and people's appetite for risk that impacts yeah. their um, decision to sort of stay in, in one state in, and practice in one um, state. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Now, to finish us off, let's ignore the contract from the seller's point of view because this is a property investment podcast. You know, we buy a property. We don't want to sell it. We want to hold it forever, um, perhaps sell down later on, but certainly the people that are looking to grow their portfolio, it's more on the on the buy side of the transaction. What, what, are, your, what are your, let's say, your biggest three tips for people that are looking to purchase a property in, in whatever state and you want to make sure that they're not falling foul of you know, the ways that they can fall down the cracks or get themselves into trouble when they're trying to purchase this property, which they're sure is going to grow by 20% in 2024, 25. Super important. Um, first and foremost, number one, engage uh, an experienced conveyancer or solicitor to review the sale contract documents before you buy. Doesn't matter where you are, you want to make sure they're casting an eye over the documents to check for any red flags that might put you at risk so that at least you've got the opportunity to make an informed decision on whether you want to proceed with making an offer on the property or whether you um, is whether there's anything you'd like to negotiate before putting in, in a formal offer. So that's the, the very first thing. I, I can't stress that enough. And very important, don't listen to anyone that says you can do it yourself. Even if you've got a legal background yourself, don't do it yourself. Get a trained eye to look over things because a, a clause might look innocent on its face, but it might not necessarily be the case. So, oh, that rhymed. Um, but anyway, um, so that's like the, that. first, uh, the first the uh, first tip. The second tip is um, before you buy, get a building and pest inspection if there is a structure on the property. Incredibly important uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, it gives you a peace of mind that you know what you're getting. Number two, um, it helps you make uh, a, a decision on what you want to offer based on the structural integrity of the property. If it, for example, if a report shows that there's extensive termites in the property, you may wish to adjust your offer and, and drop it to take that into account or to take into account the year-on-year -year maintenance costs you'd have to incur to treat termites, for example. Um, mm. You know, um, so, and, and the third is there's a principle that you buy the property as it lies, subject to everything that's wrong with it. And that rings very true in states like Victoria and New South Wales, for example. So having a building and pest inspection will give you lots of photos, lots of descriptions of what the current condition of the property is, so that if there's any change to that condition before settlement, you've got before and after comparisons and you can prove that. So having the report from the outset allows you to prove to the other party that there's been a change, hopefully not touch wood, but if there is, mm -hmm. You've got something to back you. So that's some um, the reasons why building a pest inspection is so important. Um, and number three, timing your offer and, and, and timing the professionals you engage because you don't necessarily want to waste your money um, on a contract review or a building pest inspection if there's no real chance of getting the property. So from a timing perspective, what I always suggest to clients is have a discussion with the agent about your price have you can email the agent um, you can mark up the contract itself with your your offer just don't sign it until it's been reviewed by uh, a, a licensed conveyance or, or a solicitor um, and if the vendor communicates to you or the agent tells you that they're willing to accept your offer or they they like or, or your offer falls within their target range that is the perfect time to send the contract for a review and that is the perfect time to get your inspector in because at that point you know you're in with a chance. 
So that's a really important practical piece of advice. Um, the scenario might be a bit different if it's an auction property because sometimes vendors aren't willing to accept pre-auction offers. So in that particular scenario, you, you just need to get, you need to invest in those things before you go to auction. So invest in a review and invest in um, an, ins an inspection um, uh, because, you know, you, you buy the property unconditionally from, from the auction date onwards. So they're my top yeah. three tips for anyone looking those to buy. Those are awesome. Yeah, that's, and that's a great point about the timing, right? No one likes to yes. throw away money if it's not going to be applicable to them. And, and, and even if the timing is, is perfect, you know, sometimes in reviewing the pest and building and reviewing the contract, it's not the property for you. And you do sort of have to have that sunk cost of those, uh, those services. However, they're probably costing you, uh, saving you perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's, you know, you yes. shouldn't be too worried about that. But that's an awesome overview of the conveyancing and soliciting world. That's probably the wrong word to use. But thank you very much for sharing your insights and your wisdom today, Melissa. My absolute pleasure. I'm um, grateful for being on your show. So thank you. Pleasure is ours. Cheers.